You are listening to the Bethel Church Sermon Podcast, a ministry of Bethel Church in Yale, South Dakota. If you would, take your Bibles with me and turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, we're going to pick up in verse 22. Thank you, Audrey. I always enjoy hearing that Audrey is going to come and, and sing for us. That is a, a tremendous treat. Uh, she asked what, what text we were going to be dealing with this morning. And, uh, and I love the, the song that she chose because it's all about expectation. And, and that is exactly the way that we are going today. So you'll see the, the connection there. Um, Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 22 Uh, Let's stand together as we honor the the reading of the word together. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we eagerly await for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. The hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come this morning to you and we ask for your guidance. We ask you to help us. Lord, we pray as as we deal with with this text in front of us, Lord, we recognize that it is your word to us, and we recognize that that we need your help here now. Lord, we pray that, that you would work in such a way to send your spirit in this place. Lord, open our, our hearts that, that we might that we might take in the truth of God's word that you would implant it deep within us through the power of your Spirit. Lord, we pray that in all of this, Lord, we pray that the name of Jesus would be clearly seen. Lord, we pray that in this text there would be tremendous hope. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. There, There are two problems with modern evangelicalism that I see confronted in this text. One is that we believe so often that our salvation is is just complete. And the other, related to that, is that our progress in holiness, although aided by the Holy Spirit, is an optional thing and primarily based on how seriously we take what are called spiritual disciplines. The second is a much longer conversation than we have time for this morning, but I bring it up because when we properly understand the the doctrine of salvation as not just being complete in one sense, but in in this already not yet theme, or to put it differently, how we understand the goal or consummation of our salvation greatly affects how we understand sanctification or our growth in godliness. Now, at this point, I think I just need to back up because... I said that one problem with modern evangelicalism is that we believe our salvation is complete. Let me just explain that because I think it was a little bit confusing. Perhaps I should have said that the problem with much of modern evangelicalism is that it views that salvation as only being complete and nothing else. It only believes salvation as being a past tense thing and nothing else. There is a sense in which we can say And it's right to say that we have been saved. And when we say that, theologically, we're talking about justification. We have been, in the past, made right with God. Not because of what we have done, but because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. His righteousness, his right standing in his right standing before God is ours through faith in Jesus Christ. So we have been saved. It is finished, right? That's the the line from the the song, How Deep the Father's Love, that we just sang. I mean, the, the last breath of Jesus. It is finished, says it all. It is done. So there is a sense in which we can say very rightly that we have 
been saved, that we are right with God. And that is the grounds for everything that comes next. And we're going to get to this more as we continue on in Romans 8. I'm thinking specifically of verses 29 and 30. But what I'm saying is that much of modern evangelicalism thinks only of salvation as a past event. In terms of evangelism, for instance, we are after people to place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and that is all that matters. There's nothing else that matters. As long as we get them to do that certain thing, In that moment, for many in their own lives, they believe that they're saved and they don't think much about future things at all except for the fact that they probably won't spend eternity in hell when they die. For many in the evangelical world, they live their life, or the life that they live now resembles the life of a a practical atheist. Because they've been saved, the life they live now, they just live it. And there's no concern. They live the same way other people live. And I hope this is making a little bit of sense, that for some, there is, there's this little or no impact of what Christ has done on our behalf that is relevant to our daily life. The gospel is a past event thing. It doesn't have relevance for us anymore. So what I'm saying is that what Christ has done, the gospel has an impact on us now. And there's many people that believe that it does not. They say something like, I believe the gospel, therefore my sins are forgiven, I will go to heaven. That's it. So the in-between, right? The in-between, the salvation, the placing my faith in Christ and heaven, it just looks similar to everybody else. Let me make one more clarification. I'm not suggesting that the problem is that Christians should be morally superior to atheists, but are not. I'm not suggesting that that is the problem. Christians mess up. That's that's why the gospel is relevant. I'm not saying that Christians ought to look different and that they ought to be morally superior. What I'm suggesting is that Christ's death and resurrection really has no impact on one's life now. That's what people believe. That is the mistake. They see salvation as a past thing with only some future benefit. But I would suggest that it matters now. So, it would be correct, as we have seen to speak of salvation as a past event, that's justification, just as it would equally be correct to say that we are in the process of being saved, that's sanctification, and it would equally be right to say that salvation is something that is going to happen in the future, that God is going to take what he started in in justification, in calling, and all of that, and bring it to its conclusion, that is glorification. God's desired end for each and every one of us that know Him personally. So I'm saying that the problem is that some view salvation as only a dot on a line when actually salvation encompasses the entire line. Does that make sense if you're visual? At this point, you might be asking yourself, and rightly so, What bearing does all of this have on our text? Give me a few minutes and I'll get there. First, let me just draw your attention to the to the text and to the word that 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 Paul uses uh, three times that isn't found anywhere else in the letter. In fact, this word is only used nine times in the whole New Testament. Three times are right here in this short section. The word groan. We see it in verse 22. You see it again in verse 23, and then again in verse 26. And the interesting thing is that Paul is using the word differently every time. In verse 22, it is the whole creation that has been groaning. In verse 23, it's not only creation, but we ourselves groan inwardly. And then in verse 26, it is the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us with groans too deep for words. 
And it even gets more interesting in the fact that two of these uses, I think, are extremely difficult for us to understand. One of them we talked about last time, and that is how, how does creation groan? Right? We, we talked about how, how Paul was personifying nature. But then we skip down to verse 26, and we'll get more into this later. But for now, just realize how difficult it is for us to envision the Holy Spirit groaning with groans too deep for words. Verse 23, though, isn't as difficult for us. And the reason for that is that we can identify here. There is a sense in which our groaning is part of daily life, and it is something pretty much everyone can identify with. We know what it is to be human. We know the effects of sin. We see that. We understand what it is to groan. And now we need to ask an important question at this point, and that is, what does Paul mean here? Why is he using this word groaning? Why is he using it in in different ways? What's his point? He's got to have a a point. He's choosing this word for a reason. He's applying it to creation, then us, and then the Holy Spirit, and he's got to be doing this for a reason. Now, last time, we we traced this idea the groaning of creation back to the effects of, of sin in, in Genesis that not, that not only affected Adam and Eve, but the whole of creation, which was made clear in the curse. God specifically says that the land is cursed because of the action that was taken by Adam and Eve. The groaning in verses 19 through 22 had to do with corruption by the presence of sin in all of creation. Now look at Paul's illustration in verse 22. I think it's extremely telling. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Why is Paul associating the pains, or specifically the groans that come from the pain of childbirth, to what is happening in creation? We need to understand that Paul is illustrating verse 19. For creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Now, the revealing of the sons of God needs to be understood as resurrection. right? That needs to be understood as in verse 23 and 24. the, The redemption of our bodies. And creation is eagerly, is longing, is waiting for this. The point is that creation is waiting for something that is great to come. But that time of waiting is characterized by suffering and pain. And that suffering and pain brings with it groans. Creation is living under the curse of sin and it longs for the day in which it will be renewed or brought back to what God intended it to be. This is the point. Now Paul, in verse 23, turns past the natural world to us when he says, not only creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly as the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. In other words, Paul is saying, that, he has, that what he has said about creation is also true of us. The contamination of sin didn't only touch the natural world. And I think this is exactly why Paul personifies creation and uses the word groanings and then uses it again in reference to us. I, I think he's using it that way so that we understand what he's talking about. This is, this point, this becomes a very personal thing for us. Because we start to see and understand the effects of sin. You see, we see choices that we've made. We see the consequences of them. We see death and we see dying. 
We see corruption in ourselves, like the testimony that was given earlier. We see the, the corruption there. We see what it leads to. We see the destruction that it causes. We see the sickness. We see the self-centeredness. We see all of this everywhere that we turn. My mom said to me the other day on the phone, it's so frustrating. It isn't fun getting old. She said, I thought my body would be in better shape after my knee surgery, but after my knee surgery, it's just something else. Isn't that how it is when we age? Decline is inevitable. Death is certain. And all of this, all of this process is not a fun thing. The fact is, every aspect of our human being has been corrupted by sin. And because of that, there is a sense in which we all groan, aging in sickness, sin, seeing those that we love suffer. So there is this certain sense in which we all groan. I don't think this is how Paul is using the word here. though. I want you to notice a couple things about how he uses the word groaning here in verse 23. First of all, notice that the groaning in verse 23 is specifically believers. It's specifically believers. What I just said could be true about everyone. There is a sense in which we're all touched by sin, right? Paul makes it very clear that he is speaking of a groaning that those who have the Spirit of God have. Paul says, not only creation, but we. And the question is, who are the we here? If we stop there, we would just think that he's contrasting the the natural world to humanity. Not only creation, but humanity. But then Paul goes on to clarify what he means by we specifically. It is those who have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit. Remember, in the first part of the chapter, Paul spent a considerable amount of time contrasting the flesh and the spirit. And then he tells readers in verse 9, You, however, are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of God or the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So in verse 23, Paul is making it clear that he is, what he is talking about. Those ones who groan are the ones who have the spirit of God. And Paul has already made it clear. If you have the Spirit, you are in Christ. If you do not have the Spirit, you are not in Christ. There are two groups of people. Either you belong to Him or you don't. And here, he's speaking of those who belong to Him. It is a little bit curious, though, that Paul would speak of the the believer as having the the first fruits of the Spirit. Did you notice that, that line? It seems as though Paul... It seems as though Paul uh, would have made it himself a little more clear, right? In the verses that we just read, it was very clear. And in this contrast between the, the flesh and the spirit, there are two groups of people, those who have the spirit, those who don't. Now the question is, is Paul changing his tune a little bit? Is he suggesting that we do not all have the spirit, but there are some that just have the first fruits of the spirit? I don't think that's what Paul is suggesting at all. The Spirit is a person. Either He is in you or He is not. Either the Holy Spirit is residing in His temple or He is not residing in His temple. The Holy Spirit isn't like water in a glass where you can play with the levels. He dwells in His temple or He does not. What Paul is saying here is in keeping with his overall point. And remember, what he is doing here is really unpacking the statement that he made in verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed in us. Verse 18 comes after verse 17. that says that God's children, these fellow heirs with Christ, must suffer before they receive what they are heir to. Or to put it in the language of verse 18, what will be revealed to them. And at that revelation, all of the sufferings of this world will not only be light and momentary, but they will not be worth comparing to glory. So when Paul is speaking about the first fruits of the Spirit, 
he is pointing to a reality behind our comprehension where we will experience life with the Spirit in the fullest. The Spirit is residing in you, and you are tasting this just a little bit. And there will be a time in which you will understand and you will taste this in the fullest. You see that? And that is the redemption of our bodies. So the first thing that we need to grasp here about the word groanings in verse 23 is that Paul is speaking of believers. Not all of humanity. All humanity might feel the effects of sin, but the groaning that Paul is speaking of here has only to do with those who have the Spirit. There's a second thing that we need to understand, and we've already been heading this way, and that is that this groaning that he's talking about here is expedient. It's, he, is, he is speaking of an, an expectation that we have. Notice the, the groaning that Paul is talking about isn't groaning only because of pain and suffering. I mean, it is for sure that, but it's certainly more than that. Just look at the language used here in verse 23. So those who have the Spirit, the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly. So the, the inward groaning here is connected to the waiting and the longing. See that? I don't think I'm pushing the interpretation too far because this is exactly what Paul has already said concerning creation. That it too was groaning and waiting for the day where all things would be set to rights and it would be free from its bondage to sin. Just go back one verse, 22. Understand what's happening here in verse 23. In verse 23, Paul is clarifying the illustration in verse 22. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Again, Paul is, is making at least two points by using this illustration of childbirth. One is the severity of the suffering now. The, the corruption of sin is not pleasant it causes pain, it's suffering, it's groaning, just like the pain in, in childbirth is excruciating. I hear. But, also, what I hear is that the pains of childbirth are worth it. Because there is this expectation that comes along with it. That if everything goes like it's supposed to, and everything goes how it's supposed to go, and there is this new life that is going to be there at the end. There's this, there's this expectation that this, this pain, this excruciating pain is going to be worth it. It's going to be better than you can even imagine. And there's going to be this, this life there. And this is, this is why Paul is using that particular illustration. Yes, there's, there's pain and there's suffering, but it's, it's expedient. It's, it's expecting something great at the end. Here Paul uses this illustration. He's, he's, speaking, about, he's speaking clearly about the, the inward groaning as we're eagerly waiting because he knows what is coming next is going to make everything worth it. And that's our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies that he speaks about here. So just to make this crystal clear, what Paul is talking about is the resurrection of the body. When Paul was talking about earlier that we are heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ in verse 17, he was speaking about our present, right? In our present circumstance, right now, Right? We were in this place. We've placed our faith and trust in Christ. In that moment, God has made us His child. We are His heir. And then verse 23, Paul is talking about what we will inherit. Right? We're the heir over here. What is it that we are going to inherit? We're going to inherit something, and we eagerly await for that inheritance. We eagerly await for our bodies to be resurrected, to be redeemed. When God will take what sin has corrupted and by his infinite power take it and put it all back together right and he's going to say, this is good. 
just like Jesus' body that was broken. I mean, for all that Jesus went through, right, the, the, the pain, the, the suffering there, I mean, there had to be permanent damage done to his body, right? You get a spike through your foot, you probably never walk the same way again. But just a few days later, Jesus is walking on a seven-mile walk with some disciples, teaching them how Jesus himself was a fulfillment of all the Bible. And he starts with Moses and just makes his way through all the scriptures. And these men, all the while, in the seven-mile walk, didn't have a clue that he had just been crucified. God took what was torn, what was damaged, what no human being could put back together and put it back together. So it will be with us that one day all the effects of sin, the aging, the sickness, the the lying, the, the, the weak mind, the proclivities that we have, the sinfulness that we have, all of that will be made right. It will be made good. Verse 24. For in this hope we were saved. Just think about that statement. What is your hope? What is the Christian hope? Put it that way. What is the, what is the Christian hope? If you say heaven, you're wrong. You're wrong. Notice that, that Paul is speaking of Salvation as a past thing here. He's speaking about justification, and justification is by faith alone. So he is saying, for this reason, God justified you. What is the reason that God justified you? He said it is for this reason that God took a wretched sinner who was destined for the wrath of God, opened his or her eyes to the truth of the gospel in order that they would respond in faith. And the question is, is why did God do that? For this hope you were saved. Find the answer to what Paul means here by this hope, right? What is this hope? The hope that Paul is talking about is is resurrection. The adoption of of sons. The redeeming of our body. Made clear in verses 23 and 24. We groan inwardly as as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons. The redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. God saved us over here to be this over here. Remember I said salvation isn't a dot on a line, it's the whole line? Paul, in in this passage, is speaking about two points on a line. One is justification over here. You are saved Right? You, you put your faith in, in Jesus Christ, being declared right in the sight of God, comes through faith. This is a past event in the life of the Christian. This is why Paul uses the word saved there, verse 24. Paul isn't only speaking about justification, though, is he? He's speaking about a, a future event that the Christian longs for. He's not longing for justification. He's already been justified. He's longing for resurrection. And he's eagerly awaiting that. There will be a a day in which everything will be made right. There is is resurrection. There's there's two points on a line. And here's what I really want us to see and, and think about this morning. And that is what happens between those two points on that line. Justification on one end, resurrection on the other. What happens in the middle? I think you know the answer. Because you read the text with me. Salvation is... I'm going to say it this way, an already but not yet reality. On on one side, we say that that we're saved, meaning that we are right with God. We are His. We are heirs, God's sons. We're going to inherit something greater than we can ever imagine. But that reality hasn't come yet. But for one who has placed his or her faith in Jesus Christ, it is absolutely certain. So this life, in this 
already but not yet tension between these two points, our life is characterized by groaning as we wait eagerly for our salvation to be brought to its conclusion. You see that? Listen to how James Boyce puts it. He says, It is no wonder that we groan in these bodies. They are the seed of physical weakness on one hand, in our sinful natures on the other. But we groan in hope, knowing that these weak and sinful bodies are going to be transformed into bodies that are strong, sinless, and glorious like the resurrected body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Boyce says there, it is no wonder that we groan. We continually realize how how weak we are, how prone we are to sin, how weak we are, and we long for the day where there is no more tension. When our salvation is complete, we long for that because it is the, the reason that we were saved in the first place. I said at the start that one of the problems with modern evangelicalism is that we see our salvation as something that has only happened in the past. And when we see that, and we look at things that way, we miss the tension. The already not yet tension that has tremendous bearing on how we live our lives now. And how we even approach the Lord's table. And perhaps just thinking about the Lord's table would be the the best illustration of how we live our life now. We think about this tension. Already, but not yet. Even when Jesus instituted the the meal itself, he spoke of the tension. He, He said that the disciples wouldn't share the meal with him again until they enjoyed it all together in his kingdom. So we are to do this. We come together. We partake of this meal, and we do it because we look back at what Jesus has done for us, but we look forward, right, to the day in which we take this meal and share this meal with him. There is an eagerness. There is a longing there. For when our salvation is brought to completion, for now, we come to this table as groaners. The text says inward groaners, not outward groaners, so no outward groaning this morning. But we come to this table as people who find themselves in weak bodies that are prone to sin, and we eagerly long for the day in which we will all be made right, and we inherit the kingdom. And we know that, that we will because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. We don't come to this table as people who have it all figured out. We come as people who groan inwardly because they constantly see the the presence of sin in their life and they're reminded over and over how much they need Jesus Christ. Here's the truth of the gospel. That there is nothing that you can do to ever earn favor before God. Christ has already done that. You are already accepted by God. If you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you can't do more to earn his favor. You have it. Not based on your work, but based on his. This is the gospel. And now we come to this table and we realize that Jesus has accomplished that for us. That we are right before God. This is why Jesus can say, your sins are forgiven, now go and sin no more. He wasn't saying that, her, that the acceptance before God was a matter of if we keep sinning or not. He was saying, your sin has been dealt with, now you are free to live your life as God wants you to live it. I mean, the Lord's table, the Lord's supper is a a serious time, but it's a tremendous, joyful time as well. 
It's a time when we remember that, that Jesus, His death and His resurrection has accomplished our salvation. Yes, there's tension in that. In Christ, we, we stand as heir to a promise that isn't fully realized yet. But we come to this table with joyful expectation, knowing that one day our bodies will be redeemed. We will know firsthand what it is to be a son of God. We will know resurrection. We will know life without sin. And that all that... And all of this is because there isn't anything good within us. It's because of what Jesus has done. We also come to this table knowing that apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. That the life we live now here is a life that is totally dependent on Jesus. It's characterized by faith in Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. And in that, there is tremendous freedom to live obedient lives. But perhaps you're here in all of this and, and, and you're saying, but what about this in my life? What about this sin? And you're filling in the blank. Yes, I'm, I'm a Christian. I know, I, I believe. I, I believe, but I, but I, keep, I keep messing up. And, and, and no matter how hard I, I try to do the right thing, I fall short. I have this sin, and I, and I feel guilty about it. I keep trying to stop, and as soon as I, I think I get a handle on whatever it is, I fall short. I fail. I want you to remember three things. First of all, if you are a believer, if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, remember that Jesus atoned for your failure to keep that command. Jesus atoned for your failure to keep that command. That's what this table points to. Jesus died for your sin. He died for your inability to live up to what he has commanded you to do. God has commanded that we not gossip or lie or steal or lust or whatever the sin is. And we fall short and we continue in that sin. And we mess up no matter how hard we try. And we feel guilty about our mess up. Remember, Jesus died for that mess up. Secondly, this is where the gospel becomes very personal to believers. Jesus fulfilled that command that we cannot where we are unable to keep that command and we continually fall in that sin and we feel guilty about it, not only did Jesus atone for that sin, but he fulfilled the command. He did for us what we could not do ourselves. No matter how hard we try, we fall short. And, and if Christians think that Christianity is all about moralism and doing the right things, they're, they're wrong. No matter how many to-do lists you have, you're going to fall short. No matter how many Sunday school classes you, you sit in that teach you the right thing, you're going to fall short. No matter if you're a position of, of pastor or leadership, you're going to fall short. And sometimes, and we've seen this in the news all over, and sometimes these things are very public. Jesus atoned for that failure. And Jesus fulfilled that command that you could not live up to yourself. No matter how hard we try and, and, and keep the list and do the commands, 
We still fall short. We still feel guilty. But Jesus fulfilled that command for us. He did it. He did what we cannot do in and of ourselves. Third, Jesus then empowers us to live out that command. He doesn't leave us as helpless orphans. He doesn't leave us totally weak and broken. But when we are broken, and when we all, when we come to that point that he says, no matter how hard I try, I keep falling short. And we feel this, this tremendous guilt and this weight because, because no matter how hard we try, we can't do it. And then we come to this realization that we need to be believing the gospel. And the gospel is God, Jesus died for this sin for me. He lived up to this sin where I could not. And when we place our faith and our trust in, in Him and recognize that, that no matter what we can do, it's, we're still right before Him because that's what justification means. And then He empowers us to live out the command because it's only in the gospel that we start seeing victory over sin. Jesus died for the sin that we committed. He fulfilled that command for us. There's no obligation that's left on our behalf. I mean, think about that. There's no obligation that's left on our behalf. He did it for us. Then he empowers us to live out that command. In that point, the the pressure is all off us. We can obey out of love and gratitude and not obligation. Isn't that something. And that's what the Lord's table is all about. Thank you for listening to this sermon resource from BethelMBChurch.org. If you'd like to learn more about Bethel Church or find other resources, please visit our website at BethelMBChurch.org. Bethel Church exists to bring glory to God by promoting the joyful worship of Jesus Christ both here and abroad.